Welcome, Michael. Can, can everyone hear okay? Everybody here? Okay. So okay. how many people here have been here all day? Okay. Wow. Very impressive. Okay. How many people here came just to hear Michael? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so, my, my wife is here. I, I'm uh, not sure she did. <laughs> Michael Beschloss is one of our country's most distinguished and most respected and most admired presidential historians. Let me tell you a little bit about his background before we talk a little about the presidency and then his latest book, Presidents of War, which I highly recommend, and we'll go through that. So uh, Michael is a native of the Chicago area. He went to Williams, where he came under the influence of a famous uh, historian, James McGregor Burns, and uh, subsequently uh, went to Harvard Business School. After Harvard Business School, he did not go to private equity, which he should have done. It's a higher calling. See, he, see, David did it the right way. He was always inclined to history. He took, what, about a 30-year sabbatical right. as a lawyer and private equity, and now he's come back to history. So, uh, and then Michael began writing uh, books about uh, presidency and history, and has now written, this is your 10th tenth, tenth book? Okay, and he's also the official historian for, C, uh, for N MDC, among other things that he does. You've probably seen him many times on television. And um, Michael, uh, why did you decide to be a historian after going to Harvard Business School? Most people go to Harvard Business School, they want to go out and make a lot of money and not go write history books. Obviously bad judgment. Uh, uh, when I was at William, I wanted to be a historian no joke, since I was 10 years old, I was growing up in Illinois, and the true story, I've told it before, is that I was taken down to the Lincoln House in Springfield. Anyone seen the Lincoln sites? Spring, you can clap. We're, okay. We from Illinois I love to hear that. And uh, I sat in Lincoln's uh, live, uh, parlor, and the guide said, this is where Lincoln sat reading to his children. I was very young. I said, well, actually, I wish I could have asked about civil liberties or something like that, but I was, I think, eight years old or so, and I said, actually, when Lincoln's boys were naughty, did he spank them? And the guide said with this disgusted look, no, Lincoln didn't believe in discipline. He just let those brats run wild through this house. I heard that. Lincoln was my man. So I began reading about Lincoln and other presidents, and literally wanted to write books about presents since I was 10, or a little bit earlier than that. But uh, when I was at Williams College, you know, Jim Burns said, if you want to do that, you'll probably have to teach. And I said, I don't think, you know, I've had great teachers. I don't think I could teach with as much quality and enthusiasm as I would write the books. What else could I do? And he said, well, why don't you, you know, gear to become a foundation executive I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, why don't we send you to Harvard Business School, get an MBA if you want to do that. You can go on and get a PhD in history if you want to, and that way you can write history books and not starve. Uh, and as it turned out, my first book came out just after I got out of Harvard Business School, and I was kindly offered a great job at, at the Smithsonian. This was the early 1980s, and the foundation world was spared my full-time services probably great for everyone. Right. So um, who's our greatest president? Uh, coming from Illinois, you expect me not to say Lincoln. Well, okay. I, I would I... never let be, be let back in. But I, but I would say there's a very close, uh, almost a tie between Lincoln for obvious reasons and George Washington, who essentially formed the presidency. The presidency is not described with very much detail in the Constitution. The 20th century, who would you say is our greatest president? Uh, I would say Franklin Roosevelt, who rescued us from the Great Depression in sort of a zigzag way. It was not very linear, and more important than that, rescued the world from fascism and so, totalitarianism. So you admire Lincoln, as many people do, obviously. Uh, if you had a chance to have dinner with him, what would you ask him? Uh, actually, I. There are a lot of things I'd probably ask, but it would be less necessary to have dinner with Lincoln to find out those things than it would be to have dinner with George Washington. And the reason for that is Lincoln has these extremely detailed papers, letters. They're not all preserved, but a lot of them are preserved in the Library of Congress. So you've got a pretty good paper trail. Plus, you know, Lincoln died at the age of 56. 
at a time when a lot of people who had known him almost all of his life set down their recollections and there were people who were doing books. Uh, his old law partner, William Herndon, interviewed a lot of people. And so the result is that Lincoln, you know, we'd always like to know more, but the paper trail is pretty good. The paper trail we do not have is George Washington for a lot of reasons. So if, I, if I'm allowed to have my dinner with George Washington, uh, we, for instance, know very little about his marriage. Now, one book that you, uh, I guess, helped, you, you did the Johnson tapes, is that mm -hmm. right? All right, so um, if you had a chance to ask Johnson one question, what would you ask him? Why did you feel so compelled to get more deeply in the Vietnam War when you knew that it was going south fast? And does everyone know what the Johnson tapes were? He taped his private conversations about 680 hours from the beginning to almost the end. Terrible invasion of civil liberties, but wonderful for historians. I did two books on them. And so the most heart-stopping moment in those tapes was in February of 1965, just when he was taking us into the Vietnam War for the first time in a serious way, sending off ground troops, he's talking to his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. Everyone know that name? Uh, and he's talking about the fact that the war is really beginning. And I'm expecting Johnson to say what he's saying in public, which is we expect to win. Instead, he says to McNamara, I can't think of anything worse than losing the Vietnam War, and I do not see any way that we can win. This is the very beginning of the war. Thought maybe it was just a moment of depression. That summer, Lady Bird later gave me her diaries. He says to her about the Vietnam War, I feel as if I'm in a plane that's crashing, and I do not have a parachute. So one of the things you can get from a source like the Johnson tapes, and I use this a lot, as you know, in my new book, uh, is you can find revelations like this where if we did not have those tapes, for instance, we would not know how pessimistic he was about the possibility of winning a war for which at that moment he was sending these idealistic young kids off, many of them to die. Now, he retired uh, from the presidency, he didn't choose to run for re-election. At the time I was younger and he seemed old to me, but right. he was today, he seems young. He, he was about 60 years old when he... Uh, when he retired in 1968, he was actually 59. 59, and yep. he died at the age of 64, right? So, but he died of a heart attack where today, with a, a stent, he probably would have been able to stay alive, right? Uh, you're going to kill me for mentioning this, but I actually learned that from David's new book, which is coming out next month, called The American Story. Robert Caro told that to him. So let me ask you, um, you've told a story before, and I think people might uh, be interested here in hearing it. Lyndon Johnson was worried that the people were not coming to his presidential library. So he wanted to increase attendance. What was the clever way that he uh, came up with to do that? The story I got from his great friend, Harry Middleton, director of the library, died not long ago. Uh, Johnson, anyone been to the Johnson Library? You, you can clap, it's a great library. Uh, you may have noticed that across the street from that library is a fairly large football stadium. Gets, you know, maybe 100,000 people, so Johnson, was worried about getting people to attend his library, which in the spring of 1970 and 71, around that time, he was very unpopular. And so he calls over to the stadium and says to the guy that makes announcements at halftime or his boss, something like, make an announcement at the next game that anybody, who, I'm cleaning this up by the way, right. uh, anybody who wants to take a leak or get some cool water can do it at the Johnson Library across the street. And the announcement was made, and huge numbers of people came in the front door. They were counted as visitors. This was done at later games, and I am told that by the end of that year, Johnson Library between, became the best, presidential, uh, best attended presidential library in the country. Right. So if you're asking how presidents get things done, sometimes you know, their letters tell you and their memcons Sometimes other sources tell you better. Now, you also were involved with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's um, interviews or diaries. Right. And you, uh, did you edit them or did you comment on them? Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy uh, was interviewed 
a number of times by Arthur Schlesinger not long after her husband's assassination. And these were to be locked up for about 50 years. Caroline Kennedy, nearly 10 years ago, decided that they should be opened and published, so she asked me to annotate them and sort of explain them and write a, a foreword. And the most surprising thing that you got out of that was? The most surprising thing was that throughout this book, she basically says, I had very little influence on my husband. All the credit goes to Jack. And if you read the book carefully, uh, people that she disparages, you notice sort of disappear from the entourage. People that she praises are promoted. So one thing that comes across is that he really understood that she had a very accurate ability to right. look into people, and I think he took that very seriously. And one of the other things that was commented upon at the time was that she uh, seemed to know a lot more about what was going on in the government than people thought at the time. And that's exactly right. And that's something you find with most first ladies in my experience, by the way, which is that at the time the husband serves, they always say, you know, it was always the president who did it. I had very little influence. And as you get into the inner records of an administration, you find that these first ladies, and one day I hope soon a first, you know, gentleman or first spouse, have a lot more influence than they let on at the time. So um, you can clap for that too. I, I will. Okay. So the uh, Presidents of War. It's a very interesting book about uh, presidents when we're at war. Uh, why is it Presidents of War and not Presidents at War? Uh, because the book is sort of half about how presidents took us into war, and half about how they did when we were there. So Presidents at War suggests that you're missing the first part. But the other thing is that in calling it Presidents of War. I was trying to make the point that presidents who take us into wars, they're of a category that's different from almost every other president. Okay, so uh, your basic premise in this book is that we're supposed to, under the Constitution, have Congress declare war, but we've kind of forgotten to do that. Uh, it seems to be true. Uh, anyone know the last time Congress declared war? Yes, sir? Uh, yeah, 42, 43, during World War II. Have we had any wars since 1942, 1943? Right. So we've gotten out of this habit of what the Constitution says, which is that if right. someone wants a war, Congress has to well, declare it. Why did the um, founding fathers of the Constitutional Convention say the president is the commander in chief, but he or she cannot decide to go to war. Why did they let the Congress do that? Uh, when the founders were writing our Constitution, one of the biggest things that they were worried about was that they would write a Constitution that would lead to a dictatorship or a monarchy, exactly what they were trying not to do. And because of their study of history, they found that one of the ways that happened was that monarchs or dictators would fabricate reasons for war, usually in Europe. And, and say we have to go to war, the country would unite behind the king or the dictator, and totalitarianism, greater totalitarianism would follow. So they felt that it was very important that the President of the United States not be the one that had the war power. That was in the 1780s. Here we are in the 21st century. Who now has the war power? Is it Congress or a president? So let's talk about uh, some wars where we did declare war. Um, what about the War of 1812? Did we declare war there? Uh, we did, uh, and it was a close call. And the irony was that James Madison, ever, everyone remember that he had a little bit to do with the writing of the Constitution? Madison was one of those who was most worried that there might be a dictatorship of some kind. Yet, Madison was the one who took us into a war uh, the War of 1812 against England, that the Congress, the American people, were extremely divided about, and the reasons for it were semi-bogus. One was, stop the Brits from bothering our ships. Well, turns out a couple of weeks later they did, so there was no reason to go on with the war. Number two, seize Canada. And so, you know, one way of looking at the War of 1812 that's, that's a little bit novel is, uh, you know, it's always said that Vietnam was the first time we lost a war. I would say take a look at 1812, because if our 
motives in, in the War of 1812 were number one, stop the Brits from bothering our ships. Well, it didn't do that. Number two, uh, do we own Canada today? No. This is an audience response question. No. Uh, don't think so. So 1812 turns out to be, I think, one could argue, the first war that we really lost, Thanks. and also probably the most unpopular war in American history, even more so than Vietnam. Now, and James Madison was the one who took us into that. Mexican-American War, did we declare war? Uh, we sort of faked ourselves into it. What happened with the Mexican-American War was that James Polk, who was not high on my hit parade, uh, he wanted to get a lot of land from Mexico and make the United States a continental nation from east to west. So far, so good. He did it by faking a reason for war by provoking the Mexicans to attack Americans uh, at, in South Texas. And he then went to Congress and said, we have to have a Mexican war, a war against the Mexico, Mexicans all the way to Mexico City. And the result was that, yes, uh, we did become a continental nation, but we established a precedent which is not a great one, which is fabricating a reason for war. Abraham Lincoln, who was a young member of Congress, got up in Congress and said, I don't believe there was ever a real reason for war. Show me the spot where the Mexicans really attacked us for good reasons. Now, the Civil War, did we actually declare war? No, we didn't, but that was for a good reason. That was that Lincoln said that for us to declare war would be to recognize that the Confederacy was a different country. The whole thing was Lincoln's argument that this was an insurrection, so he did not ask for a declaration. He did ask Congress for military support and other things that would help him fight it. World War I, did we have a declaration of war? Uh, yeah, that, that we did, and that was Woodrow Wilson. Okay, and uh, the Vietnam War, um, let's talk about that for a moment. The Vietnam, well, let me start with the Korean War. Uh, the Korean War, um, what pr prompted us to go to war, and was there a declaration of war? Yeah, that's where everything changed, because this was, uh, as a few here might remember, in the summer of 1950, North Korea attacked the South. Uh, America and its allies responded. And again, so far, so good. And then Harry Truman, the president, his aide said, when are you gonna to go to Congress for a war declaration? Just as, as our audience member here rightly said, as FDR had done in 1942 and a little bit in 1943. And Truman, whom I otherwise love for many reasons, not all, said, I'm not going to go to Congress to ask for a war declaration because it's 1950. Uh, there are a lot of fights in Congress. I have to you know, run a, a midterm campaign this fall. All it's gonna do is arouse problems for me in the administration. I'm just gonna go ahead and send troops to uh, defend South Korea, and I don't think anyone is gonna object. Okay. And someone called it a police action, and Truman agreed. You point out in your book something very interesting, that um, why did we actually have the Korean War in the sense that the North Koreans invaded the South, but is that because they were led to believe by Truman or his Secretary of State that we wouldn't respond? Uh, a large reason was a big goof that was made by our Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, who in January of 1950 gave a speech at the National Press Club implying that South Korea might fall outside our defense perimeter and, you know, fairly suggesting perhaps to uh, the other side, why not try to grab South Korea and test the principle? And, you know, if, if we're wrong, you know, we're wrong. And did the Russians have any objection to the... Uh, if it could be done cheaply and if it didn't lead to a nuclear and war. And what did the Chinese have to say about it? Sort of the same. So uh, when the North Koreans invade South Korea and we decide to pursue uh, defense, um, who was put in charge of the military? A gentleman named Douglas MacArthur. And what was he doing before that? Uh, he was the viceroy of Truman and the allies in Had he ever Japan. met Truman? Uh, no, uh, had not had a formal meeting. So um, he comes up with a strategy, and what's his basic strategy of how to uh, win the war? Push as hard as possible, and eventually, even if you have to cross the Yalu, 
uh, which was not Truman's way of doing things. So, uh, but MacArthur does come up with a very good landing at Inchon. It did indeed. And what was so unusual about that? Why was that such a great military feat? Well, because it succeeded by surprise and changed the terms of the war and also in, caused MacArthur to think that therefore he had license to do all sorts of things that Truman and the Joint Chiefs had asked him not to. And when he was told not to, he would actually write to newspaper publishers in the United States and say, the Joint Chiefs and the President is holding me down. You really should urge that the President give me license to go ahead. Did he want to use nuclear weapons? Yes, that was something that was within. So Truman ultimately met him in Hawaii? Is that where uh, they, or? Uh, In the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, in the Pacific. So what was that meeting like? How did that go? Uh, not bad, and it was going so well that uh, Truman decided to get out before they got to... It was uh, to leave the meeting early. Yeah. So that, in other words, they were in such agreement that he didn't want to test that by staying for too long. Okay, so what led to, to uh, Truman firing MacArthur? Uh, he saw that MacArthur was going to be extremely insubordinate, and if you were going to preserve the principle of a military that's under the command of the commander-in-chief, he had to fire MacArthur. So and, MacArthur the, and the bad joke, this is not my joke, but MacArthur came back and MacArthur famously spoke to Congress, gave this emotional speech, old soldiers never die. And the Republicans wanted him to run for president, thought he'd beat Truman. The Democrats were worried he'd run for president and beat Truman. And so it was said that as MacArthur spoke, not my joke, on the Republican side of the House, there was not a dry eye. On the Democratic side of the House, there was not a dry seat. <laughs> not but my joke. Why did MacArthur actually never do what Eisenhower was able to do, get a political constituency. He was such a famous general. Why, why did he not He was contemptuous of Eisenhower. But why did he not have a political um, pull in the United States? How come the political parties never really came to him and nominated him? Uh, you mean in 1952? Carson, yes. By then, he was considered to be somewhat politically extreme. And also, Eisenhower had come back and was a lot more popular. So Eisenhower ran for president uh, in 1952, but did uh, Truman actually offer him the nomination of the Democratic Party in 48? 1948, Harry Truman offered actually to, if Eisenhower would run as a Democrat, uh, Truman said he would run with him on his ticket as vice president. And so Eisenhower later recalled that, I think in one of his memoirs, and Truman denied it and said, I never would have done that. And the problem was that Truman actually had written it in one of his diaries, and someone found the diary page later on. So if you intend to disown something you have done, my recommendation as a historian is don't put it in your diary where it could be found. Well, actually, he got back on to some extent. He gave an interview with Merle Miller, Truman did, right. in which he said that Eisenhower had asked to be allowed to get divorced during World War II to marry his driver, right. and um, is that true? Uh, the Miller stuff is not too relied upon, but he was really angry at Eisenhower. But one really nice story is Eisenhower and Truman were on terrible terms, especially from 52 when, Truman, when uh, Eisenhower was running against Truman's uh, mess in Washington, quote unquote. But on the day of John Kennedy's funeral, the two of them were outside the cathedral as President Kennedy's casket was being brought out. And the two men were standing when they saw John Ch Kennedy Jr. saluting his father's casket. The, the two men decided to have a drink at Blair House, and they made up all their own difference, their right. old differences and remembered all they had done together. Back, back to the Korean War, Eisenhower said when he was campaigning, I'll go to Korea and fix the problem. And did Truman think that was a good idea? Uh, he thought it was a fake, and he sort of further built on his problems with Eisenhower after the victory of Eisenhower in November of 1952 by sending Eisenhower a message saying, in case you still intend to go to Korea, as if this is just some campaign stunt, made Eisenhower so furious that on Inauguration Day, Eisenhower's limousine rolled up. The Trumans were inside to give the Eisenhower's coffee, and they waited a long time because the Eisenhower's would not get out of their car. 
and Truman was furious and got into the car, and it was said that was one of the coldest rides ever when that car went up the... But, but Eisenhower did go to Korea, and did he, how did he solve the war or end it? If you were talking to Eisenhower, and this was also a, a story he told Johnson later on, Eisenhower said the way he solved Korea was he sent messages over channels that were likely to get back to the North Koreans and their allies that, unlike Truman, he would not refrain from using nuclear weapons if necessary to end this war. And the war was, at least an armistice, was imposed within about six months. Let's talk about the Vietnam War. So did we have a declaration of war in Vietnam? No, we did not. And this is the problem, you know, when a president like Truman says, well, I'm just not going to go ask for a declaration because it's going to cause me problems, it creates a, president, a precedent that later presidents might use for bad purposes. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, dealt with the Gulf of Tonkin attacks. At least one of those attacks did not happen. He went to Congress and asked for a Gulf of Tonkin resolution to use force in response. It passed overwhelmingly both houses almost unanimously. And the result was that although there was not an attack that was really the detonating incident for that resolution, for the next nine years or so, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon waged the whole of the Vietnam War, later the Indochina War, as it was, as it was, as it was expanded, based on this resolution, based on at least one attack that did not happen. And the result is that ever since then, uh, and my book only goes through Vietnam because I try to write history and I think the later things are too recent, uh, we have never again gone, had a president going to Congress and saying, I want a declaration. You've had you know, resolutions, but not the kind of declaration the, Congress, the Constitution asked for. But in, in the end, did Johnson know that the Gulf of Tonkin was based on false information? He knew within a couple of weeks, but he did not go back to Congress and say, didn't happen, he should have. So uh, subsequent to Vietnam, uh, for example, we went into Afghanistan. Did we have a resolution? No. Did we have, we have a resolution to go into... Oh, excuse me, we had a resolution, resolution. but not a declaration. We had a yeah. resolution to go into Kuwait when after right. the invasion by right. Saddam Hussein, we did that. And we had a resolution um, to go into Iraq. And I admire presidents for going to Congress asking for a resolution, but it's not the same thing as a declaration of Congress because the reason why the Constitution says this is it says we want a declaration that's very hard to achieve. We want a president to go to Congress and say this is how long we think the war will take. This is the kind of cost it might have. They wanted it to be really hard to get in involved in a war. And the resolution is different than a declaration in what sense? Uh, it's legally different, and it, is, it allows people in Congress who voted for it to say, I never voted for a declaration of war. Look at the number of members of Congress, no names mentioned, who after voting for resolutions for wars that proved to be unpopular, said they were just voting for a resolution to use force, they weren't voting for a declaration of war. Now, a declaration of war, is it like a legislation where it's passed by Congress, but then it's signed by the president, or the president doesn't sign a declaration? The president can sign it, and usually do. But yeah. a resolution, does he sign the resolution as well? Uh, can. But so doesn't have to? Yeah. Okay, so what you would like to see, um, after all your research on this, is a Congress be more forthcoming and actually passing declarations, or what would you like? Yeah, I think, I think that would be true. I'd like to make it harder for presidents to go into wars unless the, the American people support them overwhelmingly. And I'd also like to see presidents who have some of the leadership qualities that I write about in this book. For instance, in Lincoln's case, he had this wonderful empathy. Uh, Lincoln, in the middle of the, the Civil War, there were so many casualties that his people said, we've got to build a new cemetery. Where do you want it? And Lincoln said, I want it built as close to my summer house as possible because it's going to be painful for me, but I want to see the graves being dug. I want to be reminded of the terrible costs of these decisions that I'm making. So uh, today, um, as you look at our Congress today, do you think Congress actually wants to vote 
on resolutions or declarations of war, they prefer to avoid them? Oh, I think uh, throughout history they prefer to avoid them unless it's an overwhelmingly popular cause. Uh, that's something that you find all the way through history. And uh, as you think about uh, the books you've written today, or to date, which book, uh, when you write a book, how long does it typically take? Like this book took how long to write? David, I'm glad we're saying this at, toward the end of our, right. our talk rather than the beginning. This is a book that, cost, that took 10 years to write, I hope not 10 years to read, uh, but it, it goes from, you know, it begins with basically the burning of the Capitol and the burning of the White House and James Madison and Dolly running away from Washington and the President of the United States spending the night sleeping under a bush uh, in the rain because he's worried that the British will come and capture him and hang him as they would have done. And it has scenes like uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was also in combat. Everyone here been to Fort Stevens or know where it is here in Washington, D.C.? Battle of, you can clap. Uh, during the Battle of Fort Stevens, uh, Lincoln stood up and uh, there w and stood up to fire and you know subjected himself to the possibility that he might get killed. So um, when you do your work, do you research it and then complete the research and then write? Do you research and write, research and write? Pretty much do the research before, but what I really you know love to look for is documents and other sources that will tell you things that you have never seen before. Uh, I mean, the, the Johnson tapes, you know, again, are, are one great example of that because if we had not had the Johnson tapes, we would not have known how pessimistic LBJ was about the, the right. progress of the Vietnam War. Uh, we also wouldn't have known how bad his language was in private, although I think we probably But could in, have in the Johnson tapes, I've listened to a lot of them, not every one, but um, he was thought to be, um, in some cases, maybe foul-mouthed or, or, or gave the Johnson treatment. I never actually heard a lot of curse words on those tapes. Yeah, I was expecting it to be a lot worse, actually. And what it was was, I think, our definition of curses in the 1960s was so much more mild than what it was in 2019. I was expecting all sorts of words, especially one particular one, which doesn't especially appear, that if Johnson were here in 2019, I think you'd hear probably a lot more. Sort of like, uh, does everyone remember when Richard Nixon released his Watergate transcripts and there were a lot of expletives deleted? And I was in college and my friends and I thought, well, if they were deleted, they must have been pretty bad expletives. And an awful lot of them, it turns out, were probably damn and hell. But his secretary, Rosemary Woods, was so prim that she thought that damn and hell should be uh, omitted. So the way the presidency is operating uh, in modern times, if you could change it, if you could wave a wand, how would you change it? You think the presidency could be more effective the way it operates, or you think it's operating okay? Uh, I think I would. I mean, I, you always want a, a, proce a process in which Americans have the freedom to choose presidents well. Now, some people say the Electoral College uh, was designed by the Founding Fathers and it's not working as well as maybe it should have. What is your view on the Electoral College? That's, that's one example of what I'm thinking of. Uh, you could make the argument, and I think I might have a few years ago, that the Electoral College is necessary in order to make sure that presidential candidates will campaign in small states and be you know, more interested in smaller groups than if they were just in TV stu studios in Los Angeles and right. New York, which might be the case if you have the popular vote. But I think what we're beginning to see among Americans is that there's a rising frequency of presidents, and I'm not, I'm not in politics today, this is not a Republican or a Democratic comment, but you know, where a president does not win the popular vote but right. becomes president anyway. Now, in modern times, the first time we've had a presidential debate was Johnson, was uh, Kennedy and Nixon, 1960. Mm. Right. And now it's a tradition. But do you think they actually change people's votes, uh, the, the debates, and are they worth doing? I think on occasion they do, and they certainly did in the Kennedy, uh, case of Kennedy and Nixon. Uh, maybe the best moment was this was in my hometown of Chicago. Anyone here from Chicago? 
Okay. Uh, a small number, but high in quality, I'm sure. Uh, when uh, one of the Nixon people said to Robert Kennedy, you know, does, does Dick Nixon's makeup look okay? And Robert Kennedy said, I wouldn't change a bit, it looks perfect. Uh, but that was a time that John Kennedy was seen as an inexperienced, rather unknown backbencher from Massachusetts, and it put him on the same level as the world famous Vice President of the United States uh, who had debated Khrushchev. Right. I think it's very fair to say that without that first Kennedy and Nixon debate, Nixon would have been president in 1961. Now, for those people who, aren't, who haven't studied it, the, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates, they were not involved in the presidential campaign, is that right? No, they were senatorial debates. Sen and, and they were long. Long, how long were they? They were hours. And the reason for that was that in those days, and I can speak as an Illinoisan, I wasn't quite alive in, in 1858, but uh, if you went to a debate, oftentimes, you know, it would take you a long time to get there by horse. Uh, I don't think anyone ran to a debate, although maybe a few of them did. And so if you wanted to attend a debate and you would take an hour to get there, if the debate is just an hour, you're going to feel a little bit deprived. And that tradition went on in oratory in the Midwest for a long time, was adopted by Hubert Humphrey, who in the mid-20th century still gave speeches, some might remember, that seemed like about three or four hours long. And uh, I think this is a true story, uh, that, tr that Humphrey once was, even he knew he had gone on for too long, yells out to the audience, Anybody here got a watch and someone yelled back, how about a calendar? So uh, Lincoln and Douglas did not have that kind of discipline. And it's a good thing they didn't because the quality of those debates were, was so high that both parties thought that those should be the candidates in 1860 for president. It's like reminds me of uh, Jim Baker used to tell a story when um, he was giving a speech and somebody was walking away and he said, where are you going? And the guy said, I'm going to go get a haircut. He said, well, why didn't you get one before I started speaking? He said, I didn't need one before you started speaking. <laughs> right. okay. Exactly right. So um, today, um, do you find when you talk to people on college campuses that they are as interested in learning about the presidency as you were? Or is it something that people are not as focused on anymore? I think they are, and for some of the same reasons. Because you know, at this time, when you know, I told you the little story about going to the Lincoln House when I was eight years or, or so, old or so, that was the early 1960s and the presidency really mattered. Uh, there are other times in American history you might not have felt that way, but I can remember John Kennedy going on TV to say that there were missiles in Cuba, and even I at the age of seven knew that we might not survive this. Uh, I was a young person when Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill and the, and the Voting Rights Bill. So for a young kid, just reading the newspapers, everyone here know what a newspaper was? Uh, right. Telephones, uh, telegraphs. Uh, but you know, reading print newspapers, uh, the message would be extremely clear that presidents were very important. We're now at a time when you know, I think anyone would realize in this period right and not just the, the last few years, I would say the last 20 years, anyone who would watch this period you know, as a young right. citizen and not realize that it matters who is president was not paying attention. Now we uh, have a tradition started with FDR of presidential libraries, and the latest one is being built in your home area, Chicago area, but it has no books in it. So why do we need all these presidential libraries? Can you explain their purpose? It'll have some, some books, as you, but you're, you're saying it won't have books in terms of like uh, well, there's no Obama, paper. No paper. Obama, yeah, exactly, exactly. Everything's digital. Right, precisely. Uh, and books are not going to be the, the chief purpose of it and archives as some of the others. The argument of, and this is not just the Obama people, many others, and I think we are likely to see this in the future, is that you can have documents online and they don't need to be in a library, and it's actually more small d democratic if you can, for instance, gain access to the Barack Obama papers or the Donald Trump papers or other papers in the future online 
that you're not, you know, keeping out of the process of history right. people who cannot, for instance, afford to go to Chicago. And so therefore, why not keep them in College Park, Maryland, for instance, where the National right. Archives headquarters is and being able to gain access to it online. You can make arguments round or flat, but in certain ways, I think that may be, at least in part, the wave of the future. Now, if somebody is here and they haven't read this book, what is the reason they should go out and buy this book? Uh, because one of the most important things that, as I've suggested, we will be coping with through our lifetimes, whatever happens, is presidential power and the possibility that presidents might take us into war. And the other reason is that if you're trying to understand American history and understand these really important stories, you know, begin with Dolly and James Madison running out of the White House and him sleeping under the bush, and James K. Polk, you know, provoking the Mexicans, and Abraham Lincoln nobly holding the Union together, and all these stories that come right up to the, uh, to the present, you know, there is a reason why people say that you can only understand the present and the future if you understand the right. past, and a very large part of our, our past both nobly and also in certain cases, sadly, have been presidents taking us to war. All right. Well, I've read this book, and I highly recommend it to those who haven't bought it yet. And Michael, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much, David. Okay. 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 We now have an eminent, okay. eminent visitor. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, David and Michael, and everyone, don't leave because I have an announcement and a surprise. First, I want to thank everyone for another very successful National Book Festival. Thank you to the over 200,000 people who came here today to the convention center and all the people who watched it online. It's been an amazing day for authors, books, and reading. So it's time to start the countdown for next year's festival. Mark your calendars for the 2020 National Book Festival. It will be the 20th year for this annual festival here in Washington, and so we want to celebrate big. The date, Saturday, August 29th. Again, that date is August 29th, 2020, 20th year. Stay tuned, it's going to be something. Now, before we go, and here's the surprise, because it's very hard to surprise uh, Mr. David Rubenstein. Right. Look at his face. It's wonderful. The National Book Festival, as you know, is made possible with so much generosity from Mr. from Mr. Rubenstein. And aside from his support, today alone, he interviewed five brilliant authors, capping it off right here on the main stage with Mr. Michael Beschloss. Thank you. Thank you. Now, his expert interviewing skills are showcased regularly on Bloomberg TV's program titled The David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -Peer Conversations. And I want to call to the stage Mr. Justin Smith, the CEO of Bloomberg Media. Okay. He's wondering where this is going. For five seasons, Mr. Rubenstein has interviewed the world's most influential power players about their personal and professional journeys, including Oprah Winfrey, Jeff Bezos, Warren Buffett, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Bill Gates, Christine Lagarde, and many others. Here's a short clip. Good, thank you. This is good. All right. All right. Oh, this is good. Well, I watch your interview show, so I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> you go into a store, when you want to buy something, do you have to put a credit card down? You just say, I'm Jeff Bezos, and they send you the stuff? How do you do that? And do you ever had a credit card not... denied? No, has that ever happened? I, I have. Oh, I yeah. give them another credit card. You were nominated to be a chairman of the Fed by President Trump. Is being chair all that it's cracked up to be? <laughs> you have said your secretary pays a higher tax rate than you do. Yes. 
right? And Still so you're in favor of changing that. Some years ago, somebody from the White House called and said, would you mind having a tax named after you? And I said, well, if, if all the diseases have been taken away, why shouldn't I? I'll, I'll take a tax. So, in partnership, with WGBH Educational Foundation and Bloomberg, we want to celebrate your birthday this month and your support of the National Book Festival by adding all of the episodes of the David Rubenstein Show to the Library of Congress's collection because of its social and cultural significance in chronicling the lives of many important historical figures. And as part of this collection, it will be made accessible to the public to view forever. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. So David, congratulations. And here is a certificate to certify that you. your interviews will live on forever. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, good to see you, Justin. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you again for your support. You. Michael Beschloss, you are the greatest. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And thank all of you who have been here and been supportive. Thank you. The festival gets bigger and better every year. Have a great evening, and we hope to see you next year. Thank you so much. <laughs>